simple um, application security process. And we had a need to, to scale it across the entire company to really reach all the hundreds of, of teams that are building products for Adobe. And I want to tell you the story. But before I get into the details of the story, let me introduce myself. I'm Florian Nöding. I'm a principal security architect at Adobe. And I've been um, by now 10 years with the company. 10 years ago, I joined the company as a software engineer. And by heart, I'm still a software engineer. And, and I'm very empathetic to, to the developers and engineers building our products. Five years ago, I joined the security organization as a security researcher. And I did um, security reviews with teams across the end, or probably 80% of the company. And two years later, so three years ago, I started to, to build Project Kodiak. That's the logo, the big bear there. Wherever you see that, that's Kodiak. That's our automated code analysis platform. So I was initially the, the designer, the lead en engineer. I became an architect, handed off all the work to the team. And nowadays, I do um, security strategy. I take care of all the things that are shift left that happened before our code gets released to production or otherwise shared with, with our customer or products. Fun fact, I've got a blog, most uh, liked articles there, most often viewed is a German bread style recipe. I bake my own on bread. I'm originally from Germany. And with that, let's get started with um, what is automated code analysis anyway? So I understand an automated code analysis a few things. We want to look for secrets in source code. And I brought here a snippet and I've asked ChatGPT to generate a, a small script that um, talks to an API here. And um, ChatGPT had the great suggestion to put the secret directly into the snippet. So it, it literally said, replace this value here, and I put a random value in there. Oh, don't do that. People accidentally commit these secrets, or sometimes on purpose, because they, they don't know, know better to, to source code. And once they realize that's the wrong thing to do, they do another commit to remove it, but it's still in the history. So we really need for, to, do the, um, to look for these things. Also, a common thing is you did do a git commit all, um, and then you have the, your environment files if they haven't been in the ignore file also in your history. So we want to look for things like that so that we tackle this security risk. The next kind of um, security issue we want to tackle is um, vulnerabilities in third party libraries. And that's the XKCD comic, I guess most of you know it. It symbolizes that we are standing on the shoulders of giants. We make use of so many components across the, the entire open source ecosystem in our own products that a vulnerability like in XZ, which happened a couple of weeks ago, it's really important if you have a backdoor and say, where are you actually using that? Could you answer that question quickly? How hard was that? Especially software composition analysis in the C and C++ space is hard because there are no package managers. For a Ruby package, Python package, Java, it's all kind of easy. But this is a challenge. So we wanted to create an inventory of our third party components and use this inventory to figure out where are we vulnerable to these, um, uh, where we have vulnerabilities in these dependencies. The third aspect is static application security testing, SAST for short. Sometimes I also call it simply static code analysis. So we want to look for vulnerable patterns in our source code that might be sim simple structural things or data flows. Data flows are very good to capture. Injection issues where code and data are mixed. So these are all first party vulnerabilities. Here I've got another example, a minimal um, snippet that implements an API endpoint. And we have a source of tainted data, this uh, username variable that gets filled with attacker controlled data or can be filled with attacker controlled data. And then unfortunately we just concatenate this attacker controlled data with a SQL command with a query that gets later on executed in a, in a sync without doing proper output encoding. That means this application or the snippet is vulnerable to SQL injection. So we want to find things like this in an automated fashion too. There are a whole lot more things that, that you can do, but these are the three things we've implemented today. There's infrastructure as code, we could look at that too. You can look at uh, API definitions and learn a whole lot about how your program, how your software products actually work and how they interact with the ecosystem. But that is all future talk. So let's focus just on these three things. The key challenge at Adobe is um, that I've tried to capture in, in this beautiful image that I've generated. We have hundreds of products. 
We have desktop products, mobile products, we have web applications, web services, we have a web server and a bunch of other stuff. So they are all different. Very diverse tech stacks. We have 12 programming languages and these 12 programming languages only make up 80% of our code. If I want to go to 90, 95%, uh, whole lot programming languages. So basically anything other than the .NET ecosystem is widely represented across Adobe, including some very exotic programming languages like Alexia, Clojure, and, and so on, which makes security reviews and static analysis, of course, very hard. Even if we look at only one programming language, this often we have multiple frameworks. So it's all different. If you work in a big enterprise, you know enterprises acquire other companies. And for the acquisitions, the standard operation as well. Let's make more money integrated into the products, but not necessarily on a technical level, things get fully integrated. So this is the natural state. Everything evolves to more complexity, more and more complexity. We even have multiple source code management systems, not only from a single vendor, but multiple vendors. And we have multiple installations from multiple vendors. Luckily, we have one mayor in installation, which covers around about 90% of all source code. But there's a lot of complexity here, which needs to be tackled by an automated solution. Finally, we have a whole lot of uh, the developers and many, many repositories. We have over 100,000 repositories. Not all of them active, but it's kind of hard to know um, what is still being used and what, what not. And we have more than 15,000 developers or engineers in general working in, on our various products. In total, these engineers create around about 30,000 code changes, pull requests, commits, something like, like that per working day that we need to scan and keep up. So that's the challenge. Let's talk about the design of our automatic code analysis platform, how we rolled it out and what kind of impact we had on the company. And the first part is really design principles. When I reviewed what worked and especially what didn't work at other companies and at Adobe before we built uh, Kodiak, I learned that a great developer experience is the make or break of any such system. And this can, can be shown in uh, one, one key aspect is uh, you want to really deeply integrate into the developer workflow. You don't want that the developers and the engineers come to security. You want to go to them. They don't have time to deal with security as, as much. They, if you go into their workflows, they'll just do the right thing because you let them know, well, there might be a security risk here. There's a concern here. Please tackle that. We needed to provide timely, relevant, and actionable feedback. And if you compare that line to JC's keynote, the mission of, of the Marines, this timely is a very, very same, same thing. Relevant, same thing. Actionable, same. It's all the same. We, we want to provide a lot of value to, to the en engineers who are working on building our products because security doesn't earn money to Adobe. It's just a necessity of doing business. And of course, we want to shift left. That means we want to give feedback as early as, as possible. Well, not literally as early as possible, but still early in the, in, the, um, in the workflow, in the life cycle through which code flows. All these tools that exist out there to do code analysis, be it secrets and source code detection, vulnerable dependency or first party flaws, like um, um, data in injection issues, the tools are all very noisy. Some of these tools generate only 20% signal and 80% noise, so you have to be very careful how you balance that. What are your expectations to engineers? Should they fix everything? Should they look at all these issues or only tackle the most important ones? And finally, instead of having uh, engineers work with five, six, seven, eight tools in the pull request, we wanted a single tool integrated. Vendors always ask me, why did I build my own platform? And that is the reason. I can't give many different tools that have different ways of prioritizing things and there's no clear way to, to say, well, I should be fixing this first versus that other thing. So we have one single pane of glass in, into findings and source code. So the overall goal of this project is a pragmatic risk reduction. And that means we are not going to zero risk. That's not the goal. It's never the goal in security. Otherwise, well, switch it off. That's more, more secure, but that doesn't earn us money. So we really want to uh, be very pragmatic about it. This diagram is an example how, or simplified how engineers write code. They write code, they test it locally, 
they commit and push it into their version control system, they create a pull request, and then they ask their coworkers for feedback. And then they merge it, and then they somehow deploy it to production, and that's out of scope for this diagram. And we had the idea and what I've learned by looking at other tools and tools that were successful, that exactly in this gather feedback phase, we should integrate our tool. And that is where um, Kodiak gets notified by the source code management system that a pull request was created. Then we analyze it and give automated feedback. And it looks pretty much exactly as if a human had reviewed this code. So we just annotate the specific lines where we have a concern and we add a few additional comments if we find something. And that is timely, simply because the pull request was just created. It's fresh in the engineer's mind. And if you then receive within minutes feedback about what you've just written, you're also very receptive to actually act on, on this. The thing is actionable because we give very good guidance on what to do about these findings. We ex explain it. And I'll, I'll go in, in the next slide, or well, in two slides into more detail of, of that. And it's relevant because we only give, or mostly give feedback about these things that are, have been changed in this pull request. So the idea is not, well, dump the pull request full with all the findings you can find on, on this branch, but only the things that matter in that context. And you have to be somewhat quick. Most teams have pull request builders, so you, you have plenty of times that, that are processes that make sure that the um, code doesn't break any expectations, that the tests still pass, and especially in compiled languages, that takes quite a while. So we said, in addition to anything time-wise that, that is um, necessary to, to test um, the pull request by the engineering teams themselves, we have five minutes on top of that by default. So for very large and complex projects, it might take longer, but that's the number we generally want to hit. This platform enables a very small group of people to write security as code. These are simply um, rules for our tools captured in our, in our configuration files to scale security efforts a good, across a good chunk of the company. So we can't always reach the entire company because, well, a rule is probably programming language specific or at least ecosystem specific for um, software composition analysis, see, see vulnerable libraries, but this is a huge leverage point. With very little effort, we can reach basically all the developers, especially for efforts that need to spend the entire company because we have a, 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 um, some objectives to, may, well, uh, for example, fix an, a broken API and make a, and deploy the more secure alternative. This tool is what helps us do that. And for risk prioritization, we feed data ad and adversary intelligence into Kodiak. And I will talk later on about um, how to think about adversaries and what does truly matter to fix. Because there are so many issues in source code, you can't fix them all. Feedback loops, that's really the key design element of any um, security process. How do we get engineers to do the right things? And the best feedback loop is, of course, preventing stuff, but that's very challenging given the complexity of Adobe with the many different tech stacks. I can't build a paved path for every framework out there in the world. It doesn't work. So we have this inline feedback on pull requests where we are giving feedback only on files that have been changed. And this is really important, and we learned that early on because we made a mistake. In the first version of Kodiak, we just dumped all findings into the pull requests, and of course, that didn't work well. Luckily, we started only with a very limited set of, of things that we could detect, so it wasn't worse. We caught it before we had thousands of findings in the pull requests. And nowadays, we only make very few exceptions. If we have something that is especially critical, we break this rule, but still, the, um, um, the inline feedback is for net new code or any code that gets changed. And these things are prioritized. I mean, let's now talk about the next one. And you see there's, there's a gap in there. There's something else that's technically more important. But this is the next thing that we built. We built a custom dashboard so that developers could view all findings on any branch. And any branch is really important because we have many products that have many long-lived branches. Especially if you have a desktop product, then you have um, a long-term support version, and you have multiple patch levels. And all of these different versions of a product are affected by different security issues. 
over time. Only some things have been patched and we want to enable teams to really have an easy way to, to look up oh, what kind of vulnerabilities matter in each of these releases that are currently being supported. The biggest challenge with that is we are breaking the rule of going to the engineers and, and developers. Instead, we are asking them to come to us and it's not yet working well. And, we are, and that is the next, next thing um, that I want to talk about. We've started to drive security campaigns using metrics. So we are picking a, a key concern, for example, secrets and source codes, or fixing a broken a API. And um, we drive down exactly this, uh, this risk by measuring how widely this risk is deployed across Ad Ad Adobe, and then we drive people to the dashboard via this campaign. This is still work, work in progress, so we are still learning how, how this works really well. But I believe this is a powerful way to get people into the dashboard, out of their workflow and somewhere else. And the final aspect of this is enforcement. The three feedback loops at the top, it's nudging. I'm just asking the developers, please take a look. This is a security risk, but I'm not forcing them to, to do anything about it. And some, some teams have the challenge that they face a lot of pressure to deliver products on their roadmap, new features, critical de deployments, and they might not have the time to work on, on security because they optimize with a very short-term focus. At least at Adobe, the culture is largely if there's a ticket, work will get done reliably. That is. So we reserve ticketing for these rare cases where we know there's a very critical issue in there and only then will we file a ticket. And we are currently testing this with a few uh, better teams, how that works. And then we want to scale it across the entire company. You'll see there, there is not yet blocking the pull request in, in there. That's something that we'll do in the future maybe. But blocking the pull request means that our platform has to be always available because we can never um, be the reason that a critical system outage in production can't be fixed. So we need to be very mindful and empathetic about the engineers who work in these situations and have an on-call problem and need to fix it. With Kodiak, we decided to, to build only the parts that are custom to Adobe. That means the integration into our various source code management systems, the integration into the workflow, and have the capability to, to customize tools. But we are not building our own scanning tools. So it was really important, how do we select scan tools? I don't want to tell you which tools we use because your situation is certainly different. But I can tell you the um, method, how we chose the tools. So the, uh, surprisingly, the most important aspect, it turned out, was how easy it is to roll out as a code analyzers tool. Especially static code analyzers tools for the data flow analysis often need um, build system integration. And since I have so many different products, which all have different build pipelines, it means I have to ask every single team, please roll out this tool and integrate it and keep it up to date. And you know, the only thing they get out of it short term as well, more security work. <laughs> That's not compelling. So we decided to procure tools and choose tools, both commercial and open source, that are really easy to roll out, that only need source code access, nothing else. Many vendors will, will tell you their tool is, has better scanning capabilities because it either uses a build artifact or is integrated into the build system as a compiler, basically. But it doesn't matter if you can't roll it out. The value here is getting security findings. And if I get 90 or 95 percent of the quality of a tool that's built integrated with source code, uh, only good enough for me. The one exception here is probably C and C++. So um, there, I, I believe this source code analysis will be limited, but it's still a good first step. Let's, let's, let's use it and then move on to the, to the next things. There are vendors out there that tell you they can find all fine flaws with a 100% true positive rate and zero false negatives with the OWASP benchmark. That is a, um, a test suite for static code analysis tools that has many in injection flaws in, in it. But I don't want to find everything. I don't care about that. I want to find things that, that matter. So what we did was very simple during the proof of concept phase of these tools. We used an older version of our code base and scanned that. We knew what kind of security issues were in there. 
not all of them, but some of them, of, of course. So we wanted to see if the tools could either find these or could at least find them with a little bit of fine tuning. And that is find important vulnerabilities. These tools, uh, these tools output is primarily then to engineers. You can't expect engineers to be security experts. That's your job. That's my job to be a security ex expert. And writing secure co code is really hard for me too. And for an engineer who doesn't have this depth and breadth of security expertise like we do, it's even harder. So we want really friendly output. There should be a proper explanation. What is the concern? Why is it a problem? And how can you fix it? If we don't have this output, well, then the tool isn't useful. What should they do with, with a finding? Well, there's an SSRF. If you attach that to a finding, well, it's not helpful. You really need the details, what to do about it. Fast enough. On the previous slides, I, I mentioned we want to give feedback uh, within five minutes plus build time. Most tools can, can do that. If the code base is really, really big, yes, you might have to configure it so um, that it doesn't run all the rules. But usually that's not as much of a problem as I had thought so at initially, at least with more modern tools. And finally, customizable. If you're a big enough company, you have lots of code that is very specific to your own company. You're creating probably your own frameworks, your own libraries, and you want to detect issues specifically with that. So you need to have the capability to, to write content for the scanning tools, just as if you were the vendor or of, of such a tool. And not all tools are customizable like that. So that is also important. But this aspect is least important. So you will start to, to roll it out. Then you'll learn findings and you'll fine tune it and eventually you'll get to this customizable as aspect. Now let's talk about the scope. So what kind of repositories should we actually care about? Of course, we want to look at all source code repositories, but that's actually hard to know once you're an enterprise because usually you don't know everything that's going on there. So we can only tackle known source code management systems. And at Adobe, we have a ground rule, code that goes to production must live in an organization-owned repository and not be associated with a specific user or em em employee account. And then on these repositories, we run all tools and we have onboarded around about 98% of these repositories. So that is the primary scope. The secondary scope are exactly these user-owned repositories that I just mentioned. But we are mostly worried about secrets in, in these because if you have um, a user-owned repository that is public or in internal, then well, anyone can, can look at it and might be able to find a secret in there. But because this code is not allowed to go to production, we don't need software composition analysis or um, static code analysis in there. Also, most of these user-owned repositories are just forks of the organization-owned repos. So that's a future and I think acceptable, um, sorry, that's an acceptable trade-off. And this is still in the future of code. We have not yet built this part. The more challenging aspect are the known unknowns. So we know stuff that we don't know. Shadow I IT. Both somebody is running a source code management system or just a, a system that hosts a few repositories somewhere where you don't know about because oh, it's only used by a few hundred em employees. On the scale of 10,000 or well, Adobe 40, around about 40,000 employees, that's hard to find sometimes. You can be smart and talk to, the, um, to your um, SOC team and ask them, oh, we have EDR everywhere. Are there processes that look like uh, Git is running there on a, on a server? Well, then you might be able to find things, but still hard, hard to find. And then there are also um, repositories hosted on public platforms like GitHub.com, Git, GitLab, Bitbucket, and, and so on. And sometimes strange accidents happen that em employees push um, source code with secrets and sometimes without to these public repositories in their own space and it's in a public repo. They realize they mistake and then they undo it, but the secret has still been leaked. And you know there are um, systems that monitor all public activity, especially on GitHub.com. So these secrets leak there are, are dangerous too. But for Kodiak, this is out of scope and in, instead the idea is to rely on perimeter monitoring for this aspect. So now that we've defined the scope, how did we actually roll out Kodiak and what was the process? We started by with a very limited scope. 
drink your own champagne, basically. We started in the security organization and onboarded the, um, the, the, uh, the Git repositories of projects that we've maintained ourselves onto Kodiak to see if our tool did the right things, if, if it wasn't um, annoying to, to our own end engineers. And we got a lot of valuable feedback. Once we were happy with this integration, we started the rollout to friendly engineering teams. And we relied on the contacts of, of, of my, my, my team and, and myself and a bunch of other people to ask us these engineering teams, would you be okay if we integrate into your pull requests? And you will get feedback and it looks like this, we had screenshots and stuff like that. And we t told them, you can help us make this better so that we can learn very early on before we roll it out across the entire company. And to this day, we have sessions with key engineering teams that tell us what we need to do better with Kodiak. And that is very important. We want to listen to them. We can't, of course, implement all their suggestions. That's, that's too, too much to do and we have limited bandwidth. But we really can make an effort to fix the most, um, uh, the, the biggest concerns the engineering teams have with our integration in, into their workflows because we truly are in their workflow. Then we started rolling it out across all Adobe. On the slide deck, I'm saying, well, we did first the non-big repositories. We didn't know that first. We really rolled it out to everyone, step by step. But we realized there are very big repositories out there that are multiple gigabytes in size. For some of you, that might sound small. But our system has a complete copy of all source code in, internally, and we need to shuffle this around to get it scanned, and it just didn't work well enough initially. So we initially removed the big repositories, and most repositories are small, a couple hundred megabytes of, of code. So that was not a problem. Today, we support all repositories across Adobe, all these 98 plus percent. Um, for repositories that are especially big, we offer a gracefully degraded service. That means instead of scanning every pull request, we might only scan once a day or once per hour, something like that. The order in which you roll out the scanning tools was important too. We started with secrets and source code and we had a small trick to make this, um, this better. We said we are only going to inform engineers about secrets that we can actively validate. That means we had a 100 true positive rate. And we built a whole lot of trust with the engineering teams by saying Kodiak will initially, and initially was really important to stress that, show findings that we know are true positives. You won't see anything else. Yeah? Yes, so we had um, a vulnerability scanner that, that uh, looks for secrets and, and, and source code. So it inside the source code, like on the... Yes, and the, the um, having a secret in source code is a vulnerability too. Just, just imagine your source code get, gets leaked. Yes, and if you have API keys, so a couple of days ago, this vendor, Sysense, um, had its API key stolen. We don't yet know exactly how, but this uh, made an allusion to, well, maybe via source code. So. It's really dangerous. We have to be very careful that we don't put secrets in source code. Also, if you share your source code with many employees inside your organization, inside, inside your company or enterprise, that's good for developer productivity. If all engineers have access to all source code. But if you have one en engineer system compromised, that adversary now has access to all source code and your Git re uh, repositories or other code repositories are a pivot point to get in the rest of your systems. And that's a catastrophe. And that's why this is so important. And we'll talk about this prioritization later. But that is also the reason why it is so important to start with secrets. And the trick here is look for only things that are actively validated and then you get more buy-in easier from the engineering teams. <laughs> no. Um, there are open source tools, for example, Trufflehawk. Trufflehawk is one open source tool. There's another open source tool that's called GitLeaks. So that's a command line tool that you um, run either in, in, the direct, in the root directory of, of, your, um, of your checked out Git repository or you point it to a Git server, downloads all the history, scans all files and it looks for reg specific regular expressions and sometimes also entropy-based, um, well, things that look very random, random strings, 
and then raises them. And a tool like Trufflehawk is able to act Trufflehawk, like the thing that looks for the, the, pig, the pig that look for, for truffles. So it's a pretty cool, cool name. Um, that they can, um, because many secrets uh, have a prefix or a suffix, they can look, um, they can then take the secret and talk to the uh, service provider that um, has issued the, uh, the secret and then they know if it's valid or not. And they can give my platform this information too and we say, well, only tell us about secrets that are actively validated. There are lots of trade-offs, so you eventually need to tackle all these other secrets too, but that's the, the basic idea. Okay. This uh, deck, uh, the next thing the deck talks about is software composition analyzer, and that is what I would, with what I know today, recommend you to focus on. But in practice, we started with static application security testing. But let's talk about SCAR first. So SCAR allows you to create an inventory of your, um, uh, especially open source dependencies. And it is generally easier for an adversary to attack a vulnerable dependency than look for a first party vulnerability in your code. And that's why I believe this is so important. Also, your, the customers of your companies are probably going to ask you, are you impacted by the XZ backdoor? Were you impacted by log for shell All these big internet wide vulnerabilities always boil down. Do you know what's actually in your products? So that's important. Then we did SAST. We're still working on, on that. Repository settings, it's strictly speaking, not automatic code analysis, but you can also assess the security stance of the Git repositories. For example, is branch protection enabled? Can anyone push to the main branch? Is code review required? How many re reviewers are necessary to get code to production? And finally, Eventually, we want to add infrastructure as, as code, and there are a bunch of other things we could tackle in the future. And this is the outcome of what we have achieved in, in the calendar year 2023. So we got across the entire company, across the languages that we, we suffer, uh, support, and the uh, frame, frameworks and um, package managers we support, we got more than 300,000 code fixes out there. And now, Imagine we have about 15,000 engineers at around about um, 20 fixes per year per engineer. That's a whole lot of engineering bandwidth. And we got that by nudging only. So we didn't ask anyone or tell anyone, you have to do this. They did this just because we gave them inline feedback. This is a very powerful tool. But the key challenge with that is, and that leads me to the next topic, um, did they fix things that truly matter? Have we asked them? to spend this time on things that actually made the business more secure? Or was it just a waste of engineering effort and we slowed them down? I keep telling my team, the Kodak team, that our platform is a weapon to minimize developer productivity. That's a thing, in. it's a weapon. So we need to be very mindful how we prioritize security issues so that we don't slow them down. The engineers are earning our paychecks. I'm not making any money for the company. The engineers who build the products, who help ship great new features to our customers and make it compelling, these are the people who earn our incomes. So I have to really make sure that they work on the right things and don't spend too much time on security. So this is a very intricate balance. And I, can't, I can never give a perfect answer. But by talking about risk prioritization, I can come up with a model what is important to me. Now let's talk about adversaries. And this is highly, highly simplified be because we have today limited time and I could talk about hours and just in on this topic. So they are security researchers, bug bounty hunters. And if you want, join our bug bounty program too. And you can earn, earn some money. The guys over there in the booth can even give you a, a voucher so that you can get a little bit more cash if you find something in our AI related systems. And these security researchers have very different motivations. Maybe they want to break into the industry because they are not yet in security, they are in engineering or something else re related. They want to build skills, they want to make money, and lots of other things. But the key thing with the security researcher categorization is they are all friendly. They will not lead to a zero day ex exposure. Some might tell you after 90 days, well, we are going to make this public and still force you to do something about it, but at least no zero day leaks. 
And from a strategic, strategic perspective, I view this security research, especially in the form of responsible disclosure in a bug bounty program, as a way to identify gaps in a security program. So you get feedback about how well your various security systems are dealing. The next adversary kind are e-criminals. And these are often or maybe even almost always financially motivated. It's a business to them. So they want to make money out of the misfortune of other people. So to have a business, you need something that's repeatable and scalable. If you look at um, the Lockbit ransomware, and ransomware is generally a fantastic as example for e-criminals, they look for vulnerabilities that they can exploit at scale. And unfortunately, our schools, hospitals, and many smaller uh, companies get targeted because the, these basic vulnerabilities, if you don't have a dedicated security team, are hard to fix. So the strategy for um, these kinds of criminals is, or adversaries is, we want to focus our efforts on things that are easy to exploit, or at least uh, widely de deployed vulnerabilities first. And that means something like software composition analysis, a vulnerable third-party dependency, is a better target for an e-criminal than finding a SQL in injection that's um, deeply hidden within your application. The next group of adversaries are nation states. And the general idea is they have operations with targeted outcomes. That might be pretty much anything, might be espionage, um, destruction, um, to prepare for future conflict. So there's a lot here that, that's going on. Generally, this is hard to predict. I'm also lumping in to technically not nation states, individuals who um, just want to ca cause harm and just cause this destruction because they are hard to predict too. And the only strategy that works here is defense in depth. So there's not a whole lot we can do prioritization wise, but have defense in depth. So with, with this, this basic model, we can prioritize things. And we are going through these different areas. First, secrets and, and source code. So the easiest to find secrets of, are, of course, secrets that are in public or internally public repositories, anything that's widely shared. So let's focus on that first. Then we want to focus on easy to abuse cre credentials. And that especially means cloud provider credentials. If you leak an AWS access key, with the secret on GitHub.com within one minute, that key will usually be found and uh, people will try to see if it's valid. So you have one minute to abuse. So you really need a preventive strategy here. Then anything that is active and long-lived, the focus is on long-lived, because if you have a token that's only valid for 24 hours, well, maybe it's not worth actually revoking. So that's a trade-off you have to make. And then everything else. And in the past, we have asked engineers to remove, no, sorry, to not only revoke these secrets, but also remove them from the source code history. But nowadays, believe that's a waste of effort. Well, if the secret's no longer valid, what harm is it to have it in the history? Rewriting Git history is really expensive. You have to halt the world, rewrite the history to remove it, then everybody has to think again, don't do that, please. That's not empathetic to the engineers that earn your money. That doesn't make any sense. Software composition analysis. So many breaches start with out of date systems. And that's one of the key reasons and well, credentials is e even worse. I forgot to mention that. So which CVEs are most likely to be exploited? Well, CVEs that are already exploited in the world and CISA has a, a list, it's called the CAF list, the Known Exploited Vulnerabilities Catalog. It's a bit open between 1000 and 2000 CVEs. You really should patch these things. Also, it's a brand problem, a PR problem. If you get owned for a CVE that's widely known, then it's a long time, then everybody else will conclude your patching strategy at your company isn't working. So it's kind of important to, to patch that stuff first. Then the next thing I, we are patching is CVEs where an exploit is publicly available. Because if that's available, it's, that is an indicator that exploitation in the wild might, may happen. It's not guaranteed. So and this is not a strict priority order, but that's the best way how I could visualize it. So you need to weight these different things in different fashions. 
likely to be exploited. You know, in my ex experience, maybe 2%, probably less than 4% of all CVEs somehow impact the applications I'm dealing with. So any CVE, and some people call it a curriculum vitae enhancer, because it's cool to have found a CVE, are kind of a denial of service against the entire software industry because everybody now has to patch that thing and look, where is it de deployed and release uh, patch notes and, and so on. It's a whole lot of work. But most CVEs never see exploitation in the world. Even if in some, in, in some case, even if a public exploit is available because the place where the, CVE is, the CVE could be exploited is so deep inside our systems that first other defense and death measures need, need to be um, um, exploit and then you can only exploit it. And first, the organization that is also maintaining the CVSS scoring system is maintaining another scoring system. And that would be another talk of its own. It's called EPSS, the Exploit Prediction Scoring System. Well, this score has a value between zero and one. One means in the next 30 days, it's extremely likely for the CVE to be exploited. And zero, it's very, very unlikely. And for almost all CVEs, the number is very close to zero. So they have trained a machine learning model on, uh, on that compares past data, where we knew which CVEs have been exploited, based on the, just the textual description with lots of metadata of a CVE. And this thing is actually pretty good. So, and it's a way to reduce the effort you spend on patching to things that probably matter. So you could just uh, the standard strategy that most companies use is patch any CVE with a CVS score of seven and higher, so all the highs, basically. But unfortunately, we see exploitation in the wild even of CVEs with scores of three something and five. So you want really to patch all threes and fives for security. Your teams don't have time for that. And that is everything else. But unfortunately, we have customer expectations. So Adobe sells products also into heavily regulated industries, especially the financial service industry. And for our on-prem products, that might be a desktop application or a web application that is run on the customer's own hardware, they run their own software composition analysis tools across our products to figure out what kind of vulnerabilities are in our third-party dependencies. They tell us sometimes, please fix everything. So the, here is now a, a very important split. We have um, security work that follows this priority list and then unblocking sales on the other. And that's just cost of doing business. That's not cost of security. And I'm very vocal about this distinction because I believe it will get worse soon. The US government and in Europe too and other countries worldwide, there, um, there is an increased focus on software security. So, and this will manifest itself in the need to publish software bill of materials, which is exactly this inventory list, to our customers, government and otherwise. And they are asked to, to, I expect them to ask to fix things according to the CVSS score and not to this more, uh, this, um, more risk focused strategy. Based on these customer expectations, I, it's not an urgent priority me, for me to filter out unreachable CVEs. So the security industry invests a lot of effort into this area, but I'm not yet fully convinced. Especially if you have to share an s well, they might not even care if it's reachable or, or not. Just fix it, please. And in the future, we want to use contextual data. So the question is, um, how, is effectively how much do I trust reachability analysis and how do I tell customers if this is truly the thing, how do I balance a human looking at it versus a, a machine telling me. We haven't yet implemented this simply because I, while I believe it would be certainly helpful to have the context, it's not really important because too cus many customers are expecting us to fix everything anyway. So in the future we want to do this and I believe we'll just have to rely on, on the vendor 
and I'm speaking already to various vendors and tell them I need detailed information why you believe this is reachable or not. And don't uh, tell me a, a binary thing, it's reachable or it's not reachable. Tell me you're absolutely sure it's reachable. Tell me you're absolutely sure it's not reachable and then give me an in-between in value for confidence. But that's for us in the future. Yeah, it's, it's much, much simpler. The idea is, um, let's say you use a, you have a crypto library and the RSA functionality is broken. If you don't use the RSA functionality, what's the harm of the CVE in there? So that's the, the level of granularity. For SAST, I haven't yet figured it out. So the basic process of exploiting in the wild and so on still works, but if you have figured this out, please talk to me. I would like to learn for, from you. The key thing I'm thinking about is this is not only CVEs, common vulnerability exposures, there's common vulnerability enumeration, so SQL injection, cross scripting, and so on. How can I map this to adversary techniques, tactics, and procedures? <laughs> and finally, we want to have unified risk prioritization. So we are telling our engineers, please fix um, exploiting the wild stuff first, then fix your critical secrets and then likely to be exploited vulnerable dependencies than everything else. See, everything else is a little bit more complex, but um, you will f have to find your own uh, weighted prioritization scheme here. And now the, to slowly close the presentation, I want to talk about the meta feedback loop. So how are we thinking about the whole system and how do we want to Im improve it by going through the OODA loop, the, uh, um, that was mentioned in the initial, um, the first session today. We can think of shifting left not only in the terms of is it early in the development process, like writing code or late, like being deployed, but also in terms of six buckets of risk. One bucket is it is exploited. You have an incident. It's not yet found. You found it externally by a bug bounty program, for example. You found it manually. If you had a human look at things, that might be a pen test and a red team, and you might argue a red team is found externally, but it doesn't matter that much here, I guess. Then you have uh, security reviews and, and a bunch of, of other things found manually. Found automatically. That's what Kodiak is, is doing for us. We have SCAR, SAST, but DAST, fuzzing, and all the other things you can automate are in there. But the coolest thing would be really prevented. So secure by design, secure by default, and paved path. But as I said, at Adobe, this is really complex to do at scale because everything's different. So the key idea is think about fixing root causes prevention. So just detecting secrets in source code that and asking developers to fix that is fixing a symptom. There's a reason why secrets are in source code, why it is hard to not have them in source code. There's a reason why people have SQL injection. It's not because they don't know about, the reason is because they've not been taught to use a daemon ORM, an object rel relational mapping system. So fix root causes if you can. Finally, all these things give you feedback. Anything that is found on the right side hasn't been caught by something further left. So you have program gaps. And I mentioned the bug bounty program as a key source of information here. Merge that with what you know about adversaries. Your uh, business strategy, very important. And then you have a security strategy and invest in these different aspects. So the key takeaway is, I believe everyone in security has to focus on great developer experience and talk to them. Make sure that you really understand their needs. The feedback loop design is crucial. And if you only want to take two things away regarding fixing what truly matters, consider using EPSS for software composition analysis and incest, try to target the root causes instead of fixing symptoms. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions?
Yeah, so the question is uh, why we chose to build our own system instead of using a commercial vendor solution that um, basically does all of this in an automated fashion for you. So it's a make or, or, or buy question really. The key challenge I had was that um, the vendors who had the best SAS tools didn't have the best software composition analysis tools. So I already had to work with multiple vendors and secret scanning is even a, a, another problem. We also figured out that um, the majority of the work is actually integrating any vendor-based tool into our complex internal landscape. So focusing on the things that are custom to Adobe and abstracting the security tools away from the company enables us to, in over many, many years, have the ability to even switch out security tools because we abstract them away from the company. The rest of the company doesn't really know which tools we are using. They sometimes ask, but they, they don't know. So um, I can focus on things that are specific to Adobe. The other reason is tools like Kodiak didn't exist back then that could do this merging of multiple different scanning tools. And there are cool si side effects. I didn't have time today to talk about the architecture, but we have a code search engine too. Just imagine having all of your company source code at your fingertips and you can enter any regular expression and give an answer within seconds. That's fantastic for a security team if you have an incident. We are a, the index is, yet, is not yet kept up to date. We didn't have time, it's more proof of concept. But it's a fantastic capability. So having the ability to really customize things is powerful. But it depends on scale. So if you're a small company, well, just buy something. If you're a really big enterprise, tens of thousands of engineers, well, so then probably custom is the better answer. Yeah. Yeah, we can't, in short. Business logic errors um, are not something that I've seen static analysis tools do well with. Static analysis tools can figure out a, a a pattern in, in source code, for example, you have a print statement in, in a for loop. That's something a SAS tool can find easily. Or you have a data flow from a um, uh, variable in your API to through various transformations to a function that executes a SQL statement. Um, but business logic, access control is super hard. So maybe in the future we get AI to do that. We'll have to wait. Uh, fuzzing is, is not in scope for this, but we have other projects that um, fuzz our uh, C and C++ code. Yeah, it's closer to our desk team. Yeah. We basically rescan, and anyone can via the dashboard uh, issue a request to rescore their S form. Yeah, and it's also about finding CVs. Just because you scanned one week ago doesn't mean there. Uh, well, if there's a new CV in after that scan, well, you have to scan again to to see it. Yeah. I've got time for one more question. <laughs> 